Vice President for Energy and Sustainability here at the Institute of the Americas. And we're very pleased to do, uh, conduct and host our latest installment of the Institute and the Energy Program's Energy Webinar Series. And today, live from Buenos Aires in Argentina, we have a very timely discussion with a representative from Argentina's YPF, Dr. Elena Moratini. Dr. Moratini, Elena, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you joining our webinar series. Thank you, Jeremy. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear from Buenos Aires. Right. Perfect, perfect. Well, for those of you who've been joining us and participating in the webinar series or, or more broadly following the Institute of the Americas, you know that for the last couple of years, we, uh, like most followers and, and uh, thought leaders on energy issues across the world, but particularly our hemisphere, have been looking at and trying to better understand just exactly what the global energy transformation uh, and all the rapid and, and radical changes in the energy sector around the world signify and what they mean for our region and, and countries and companies in Latin America. And uh, so in some of our discussions more recently, we've had representatives from OPEC talking about this topic of energy transition. Uh, we've had several roundtables just last week. We were in Colombia with some discussions, both in terms of the oil and gas sector, but also a breakout session on just indeed decentralized energy distributed generation and many of the issues of, of renewable energy deployment, but broadly the energy transition. And uh, and so we're very pleased today that we're going to pivot to Argentina and YPF. And in fact, during some of our panel discussions in Madrid, the issues of where um, state of enterprises and where national oil companies or where uh, firms operating uh, across the spectrum of state and private participation in the sector in Latin America, where they fit and how they are going to evolve operationally, financially, and strategically uh, in alignment with or, or in, in, in accordance with this global energy shift and transition. And we are very pleased today that Elena Moratini, who currently is the geoscience advisor at YPF in Argentina, and she comes uh, with a deep background in the oil and gas sector, uh, in fact, she has an earth science undergraduate degree from University of Italy and then a PhD from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. She's worked for over 20 years in the oil and gas sector uh, since 2007 in a very uh, in varying roles at YPF, most recently in her current function as the geoscience advisor. And she has since 2005, and this is very relevant for our discussion today, since 2005, Elena has been um, alternating positions, but uh, principally vice chair of something called the Horizon 2020 Marie Curie Actions for Energy and Environment, which is part of uh, the European Union. And finally, I would like to highlight, and again, very relevant for our conversation today, in her role as the geoscience advisor at YPF, and most, most of you remember that Argentina hosted the G20 and was very involved in the, all of the events around the G20. Um, last year. She was a principal officer from YPF as part of the Energy Resource Efficiency and Sustainability Task Force for the Argentina, the B20, so the Business 20 that was part of the, the global G20 summit that Argentina chaired and hosted last year. Um, so we're, like I said, very interested in what she has to share with us, both from her deep background, but also what exactly YPF is doing. Um, and, and as she and I have talked in preparation for this, We've used the word that YPF has embraced the challenge of this energy transition. And in fact, she's going to share exactly what they're doing in that regard. Let me finally mention that with Elena from the YPF office in Argentina, uh, participating with her today are Joaquin Mashubian, who is the head of international affairs at YPF. Joaquin, thanks. Good to have you on the line. Hope, hope you have the chance to chime in. And Hi, Jeremy. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I, I hope all is well. I, I know it's uh, interesting moments in Buenos Aires. We will we'll, uh, we'll focus on energy transition and leave the politics out today. Um, we'll come back to that later. Uh, also, wanted to mention with uh, with with uh, with Joaquin and his office is Ignacio Yakno, who is an intern in the International Affairs uh, Office there in, in YPF in Buenos Aires. So, without any further ado, let me let me hand the microphone over, as it were to Dr. Elena Morantini for her presentation on just exactly what it is YPF is doing to, as I said, embrace the challenge of the energy transition. Elena, thanks again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this perfect introduction.
<clears throat> Elena, are you, it seems like we have lost audio for one, hold on one second. Are you there, Elena? Elena? <clears throat> we cannot hear, uh, Joaquin, we cannot hear Elena. Something happened. Is she dialing back in? Elena? Oh, there she is. Hi, can you hear us? Yes, I'm very okay. sorry. Something, we lost you right when you started to speak. I've, I've yeah, I, I I couldn't actually manage the slides. I mean, let's see if we can do that. Yes, okay, it seems as if it's working fine. Okay. We hear it loud and clear. I hope everyone else hears you as well. <laughs> okay. All right, we're starting all over. Thank you, thank you. Over to you, Elena, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks again for having us. I think that the presentation and introduction was perfect, so we just move on to the topic so that we, hopefully technology will stay with us. So uh, to start structure of the webinar, what we would like to, um, talk to you today and discuss with you later on in a Q&A session is basically the global energy challenges that we're facing today, the definition, broad definition of energy transitions, what is our view from IPF on the energy transition topic, the opportunity of the B20, as Jeremy was mentioning at the beginning, it has been a great opportunity for the country and for us because we've been leading the uh, Energy Resource Efficiency and Sustainability Task Force for the B20, and we will see in detail what that work has actually led us to. And then a bit more about IPF and um, the roadmap that we have uh, decided to put forward for energy transition in the company. And uh, last but not least, what is ahead of us? What can we, what, what can we hope for the energy transition from now onwards? So um, let's see, um, challenges. The global energy challenges as referred to the end of 2017. This is mainly because we want to have consolidated numbers and basically not um, discussing over projections, is that in 2017, the global energy CO2 emissions grew by 1.4 percent reaching a peak of 32.5 gigatons that number the, the the trend the increasing trend has been confirmed in 2018 and actually we have confirmed number of 33.1 gigatons in terms of emissions 
energy efficiency improvements have slowed down also because of different oil and gas prices throughout that period of time. And um, resource efficiency is an item that still lags in the leader's agenda and that hampers the necessary transformations that we know we have to go through from linear to circular economies. We know that we have to abandon the linear model of economy, which is the take, make and dispose and go towards a more upgrade and recycling type of circular model that allows a different treatment of all type of energy sources and sources in general and resources in general. Um, another number which is not a happy one is that of the amount of people which are lacking energy uh, as a basic right worldwide and that number at the end of 2017 was 1.1 billion. That is a good news that in during the course of 2018, uh, 2018 that number actually decreased to 900,000 people. And um, in respect to climate change also um, emphasizing that only 7% of investments are actually devoted to climate. So these are the main challenges we're facing, but these are not the only ones. Um, as we were looking at with the teams in terms of uh, actual news in these days, of course, everybody knows what has happened in Chile. And because of the um, civil society issues in Chile nowadays, something that is, is affecting the general uh, discussion also on energy transitions, of course, not only that, I mean, that of Chile is a big tragedy in terms of society, is the fact that the COP, the uh, conference of the parties that was supposed to be handled to be, to take place in Chile at the beginning of December has now had to move on to Madrid, change place, change location, because basically uh, the civil society is reacting to many issues that uh, somehow are also related to new investments needed in terms of climate change. And that is a reality that we need to face as a, as a challenge in terms, of course, of, uh, of our agenda. And at the same time, we know very well that uh, from the United States, news uh, um, facing the Paris Agreement are not good ones in terms of withdrawal of the United States as it, as it has been recently announced. So this is to say that the global challenges are of different types. Some of them are under our control in terms of what we can do as industry or governments. Others are possibly to broader scope and uh, can less be addressed in, in a sort of roadmap for energy transitions. So what you see here to the right is indeed the um, a graph with um, the overall emissions and what we can see in terms of projections, as we, we were saying before, for the year 2018 is that the uh, 2018 has been projected as the faster growth pace in the last seven years in terms of emissions. So we definitely have a problem there. And at the same time, the dual challenge is indeed that of facing this growth in emission at the same time as having to face a growth in energy demand to, for example, 2040, due to uh, the growth in population and, uh, and the economic growth. We will not have the time today to go into the detail of uh, the most recent discussions on decoupling energy production from emission rates, and also in some cases, decoupling energy consumption from uh, economic growth of countries. But I think that that is something we need to bear in mind because actually the situation, I mean, the overall picture is more complex than, than what we're seeing because there are data that, um, very recent ones that can actually um, uh, some, somehow uh, get more complex in respect to what we are just discussing today. But I think that we have enough on our plate for this uh, webinar to, to stay entertained. So what we see here is we've, we've been talking about projections. What we see here are real data. These are the measurements that come from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography from the University of San Diego at the Mauna Loa Observatory. The reason why I thought that it was good to plot a few of this very simple and elegant data is because I'm sure that there are no skepticals among us, but um, the scientific argument on uh, the relationship between anthropogenic CO2 and the planet temperature is a very straightforward one. And uh, these measurements from the Mauna Loa Observatory do demonstrate that quite clearly. 
And there, it's always good to go back to the hard data of uh, the scientific evidences. So what we see here to the right is basically the daily and week record that we can have of CO2 concentration at the Mauna Loa Observatory. And you can see the different um, average uh, by the hour and by the day. To the left is a whole week. To the right is the the past two years of uh, records of the same data, where you can see that there are, of course, uh, seasonal shifts. But what you basically see is that, unfortunately, the trend is an increasing trend. Same thing here. What you see is the entire data, data set of uh, measurements at the Mauna Loa Observatory to the left from 1958 till today. And what you see is that there is no change in that trend. The trend always shows an increase. And that same trend, if you plot it against, I'm sorry, there is a mistake on the upper title. It's not 800 years, it's actually 200 years from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It's, um, it's basically the, the ice measurements towards the actual records at the Mauna Loa. What you see there as well is that the concentration of CO2 in parts per million, the only thing that does is actually keeping, keep on increasing. If we look at the, especially if there are geologists or geoscientists among us, if we look at a longer term trend, that of the Earth in the last 10,000 years or 800,000 years, what you see is that between ice age and inter, inter, interglacial periods, the fluctuations always stay more or less at a certain threshold value around 300 parts per million. And what you see here is the exponential growth of the last 50 years. So all these data actually are saying that the measurements are quite clear in terms of increasing of CO2. And here is for those of us that uh, think that following this data is of relevance to what we're doing, the tweets from uh, the, the Keeling curve, the Mauna Loa Observatory shows us daily the variations and the measurements. And to the right, a bit more of a complex publication in science, which actually um, emphasizes the causal relationship between CO2 methane emissions and CO2 emissions. So of course we're not going to go into the detail of that, but the bibliography is there for those of you that are interested in seeing how um, the scientific arguments that do actually relate, if there is still need to do that, the uh, temperature of the planet in respect to the emissions, CO2 and methane specific emissions. So. Um, as a summary of that, the value today is around 410 parts per million. And of course, that number is strictly related to our fossil fuels emissions. What you see to the left is some of the scenarios and the dotted line are the projected scenarios for um, what is going to happen to the levels of CO2 in respect to the, the fossil fuels emissions. And of course, as we were saying before, what you see is that there is a direct correlation between these two numbers. So, so far, um, we see basically quite a sort of difficult um, scenarios, but um, science and um, actions can be on our side. And what you see here is um, basically the trends of emissions of greenhouse gases emissions in respect to the Paris um, um, uh, goals, which is that of the not increasing above two degrees in respect to the pre-industrial uh, era and the 1.5 degrees by 2000, in, in this case it's 2030. And although this is a sort of wishful thinking, what has been presented in New York at the UN uh, Climate Week is that by the New Climate Institute, which is one of the most uh, uh, referenced institutions in terms of um, documentation of, of climate and ambitious goals, is that if we sum up all the individual actor targets plus the international cooperative initiatives plus the national determined contributions, there is a clear scope, as you can see in, in the two degrees range, that we can actually meet the Paris target. So this was just to set the scene of where we are in terms of emission, what is the current data set, what are the records, and what are the future scenarios ahead of us. And this gives a very important message in terms of international and supranational consensus, which is that if there is an agreement in terms of fighting those, of course, uh, 
uh, very high emissions that we've reached today with the sum up of all the actions plus the nationally determined contribution established by the Paris Agreement, there is a chance that by 2030 we can still reach the lowermost range of the interval here in purple that you can see in the slide on staying below the two uh, degrees Celsius increase above pre-industrial levels. So this is quite a positive message and that basically means that civil society, um, public governments and uh, private sector all together, what we call the three parts to tango, if together um, in a coordinated and supranational way can actually go beyond what is that target and reach um, the, the, the Paris Agreement goals by 2030. So it's wishful thinking because of course we need to have the plans in action to be able to do that. But um, uh, if we fulfill what the majority of these uh, stakeholders have actually uh, put forward in terms of roadmaps, there is a possibility of reaching that goal. So that is enough for the challenges. We now move on to the definition of energy transitions. What we have put here is a definition that comes from, if the slide comes up, here it is, from the World Energy Council, which is a bit of a complex definition of energy transitions, but we think it's worth uh, analyzing it in detail because what we are trying to avoid, especially coming from integrated energy industry, is thinking that energy transition, it's only a matter of renewable. Energy transition is something that actually um, uh, concerns us all from every action we have in our private life to uh, the energy sector in which I suppose that the majority of us is actually working. And we think that this uh, sort of paragraphs do actually summarize that um, it is a complex subject and it involves, includes every type of energy, not only renewables. So let me read it out. It says, fundamental structural changes in the energy sector, also called energy transitions, occur worldwide and are not an isolated phenomenon. However, energy transitions differ in terms of motivation and objectives, drivers and governance, and also provide a diverse set of challenges and opportunities. That is very important. It's very important that we stress the fact that it's not only challenges, it's opportunities, opportunity that will uh, be reflected in business opportunity and, of course, in cultural opportunities in terms of especially energy efficiency. We will see this in detail, but this paragraph for us, it's very important to give a sort of broader um, implication to the energy transition. And it also gives the possibility of any actor or stakeholders to take different paths in their energy transition as long as that goes in the direction of decreasing emissions. Uh, what we have here is um, just a summary or a representation of one portion of the energy outlook published by BP. We can take examples from any of the outlooks nowadays. The majority of the oil and gas or energy companies do uh, provide scenarios on how they see their future for decreasing emissions and how the different energy um, sectors will change as a function of that. And the reason why I've, pot I've plotted this, um, this graph is just for you to see that even in the case of uh, the most aggressive scenarios in terms of lowering emissions, which is the ones to the right, uh, 2040, the energy transition, ET stands for energy transition, LCP stands for um, lower carbon power, which is one of the most aggressive scenarios presented by BP. What we see there is still that we have fossil fuels in those scenarios, and those fossil fuels, in order to participate in the best productive way, will have to tackle their issue of emission. So basically, our message is that of saying that energy transitions do not only include renewables, they're not just a matter of renewables, there are also our way of oil and gas or uh, integrated energy companies to start moving on and produce better energy. I'm sure that you've seen many of the uh, big uh, energy companies' uh, visions and missions and, and proposals nowadays uh, that do actually the majority of them talk about how to produce better energy. So uh, good news are also the fact that, of course, there are transactions that are being um, increased in terms of size and amount of transactions for green bonds. 
and that is also of course very good news in terms of energy transition and this graph i think it is particularly relevant to us this comes from the boston consultancy and it is about the pressure that has been actually placed on boards of energy company in respect to energy transitions our president, Miguel Gutierrez, when he was asked if we are doing energy transitions because we are convinced of it or because that is what the market is actually asking from us in terms of uh, pressure, uh, he gave a very clear answer saying that we are doing this because we think that this is where progress is going, but also it is somehow positive to feel the pressure of society and markets because that makes uh, somehow the whole issue moving faster. So what you see here is basically the response of boards to um, shareholder pressure. And you see that in the past four years, we've had an increase of about more than 100% in terms of responses to how we tackle the issue of energy transition and how do we decrease our emissions. So we move on now to what in IPF we have um, decided to um, emphasize and foster as our uh, policy and strategy on energy transition. So first of all, just to put you into the scene, we are and we are the leader, we are the leading energy company in Argentina and, and the energy matrix in Argentina is quite a clean one if we compare it to some of other energy matrices across the world. What you see here is that the Argentina matrix, which is the first column to the left, has a dominance of natural gas over oil, basically no coal, uh, less hydro in respect to the majority of the South American uh, um, countries, but still a good component of uh, hydropower generation, and about 1% at the moment on renewables. This is just, we're not going to go into the details of the Argentina matrix, but this is just to show you that um, even those um, emerging economies that have quite a clean matrix need to tackle the issue and take care of their policies in terms of energy transition, because that is something that we all need to do, because in the end, as we saw from the Mauna Loa records, the atmosphere is one and we all need to take care of that. So. What are we doing in IPF to take care of that? Is basically thinking that energy transitions are a transformative social and economic path that fosters the adaptation of all energy systems to new rules of production, storage, transportation, distribution, and use of energy. And I apologize if the second paragraph cannot be really easily read, but what it says, that is a quote from uh, from Shell, from the Shell chairman, which basically supports somehow and uh, reinvigorates what we're saying, which is basically the oil and gas industry has a lot of technology and expertise that um, needs to be used also in terms of energy transition. We do not need to be an anchor to hold it back. We need to be an engine to uh, technological progress in order to uh, contribute to this transition. So it is very clear that uh, the oil and gas energy has lots of professionals and very skilled ones, especially in the fields of engineering, that can contribute with idea and innovations and methods to the energy transition that uh, we all need to face and that basically civil society is asked us to take care of. And the second quote from the Institut Français du Pétrole is also a very good one because it basically says that there is no good or bad energy. I mean, energy, uh, it's the way we produce energy that changes the whole scheme. And energies can be complementary and we can find ways of producing better energy even from fossil fuels, which is basically the message that we think we need to uh, somehow put forward and, and be able to advocate. So um, that was our vision on energy transitions. I hope that that was clear. If not, we can, of course, go back to that during our Q&A session. Let me now move on to what was a big opportunity for the country and for us as a company, which was that of participating, as uh, Jeremy was saying at the beginning, to the um, 
G20 and B20 fora of last year, of 2018. Argentina hosted the G20 last year, and IPF had the chance of uh, uh, leading the task force on energy, resource efficiency, and sustainability of the B20. The B20 is basically an affiliated group. It's the business unit associated to the G20, where many of the proposals and propositions and recommendations are put forward to the political group. And uh, specifically on that is what we've been working um, during 2018. As you can see here, the task force, the energy task force was called, as I said, Energy Resource Efficiency and Sustainability. And together with 130 companies from all over the world, uh, which of course had an affinity with the energy sector, we worked together to put forward recommendations to the energy ministries of the uh, G20 uh, forum. We worked in a very cooperative way. It was an incredible experience for all of us. It was an incredible experience for the country, for the company. And uh, um, I think that uh, although the recommendations may have not been too ambitious, those recommendations managed to reach a consensus. And as we know very well nowadays in a world of uh, uh, where multilateral uh, agreements are actually seeing a moment of, uh, of calm, unfortunately, the fact of being able to reach consensus among 130 companies from very many different countries, from very many different sectors. Some of us were pure upstreamers, other were oil and gas, other were fully renewables companies, so very green company like, for, for example, Iberdrola. So we needed to find a consensus on what we wanted to recommend to the energy ministries. So I emphasize here the fact that uh, we have reached consensus on accelerating transitions towards a future of lower greenhouse gases emissions consensus on having to draw our roadmaps towards cleaner energy in terms of renewables, natural gas, geothermal, cleaner fuels, biofuels, hydro, hydrogen, and all the technological innovations included therein. One particular important aspect, that of transition readiness that will come back later on, is an aspect on which we're very proud of having been able to find consensus. Transition readiness basically means that from any type of energy company, although maybe of small size and with not enough budget allocated to energy transitions, there is still a lot we can do in terms of getting ready for. That means being prepared to the energy transition, having human resources at, uh, assigned to the uh, transition readiness topic so that whenever we will have the budget finally to do that. We are ready with a plan, with the scheme, and with the correct human resources to be able to embrace the challenge, as we said at the beginning. And last but not least, we reached consensus on the fact that we cannot allow any human stranded assets. That means that basically this transition needs to be a just type of transition, i.e. a transition that includes and has at its heart the human capital that is still, that is nowadays forming the skills and the task forces of the companies that do perform energy transitions. So, the recommendations. This is a lot of text. I'm not going to read it out all. I can send you the publication. It's public. It's, it's on the B20 Energy um, Argentinians website. But just for you to have a flavor for that, we put forward five main recommendations on energy transitions, energy efficiency, access to energy, circular economy, and climate change adaptation. And you will see again a slide like this one at the end of the presentation when we will go into the details of what is the roadmap put forward by IPF to sort of um, uh, follow these recommendations that all together, the 130 companies we put together last year as recommendation to the energy ministries. There are 11 actions therein and 29 specific actions. What this work is useful for is that basically each company, uh, regardless of where, um, where we stand in terms of energy production, can check up what the main recommendations were to tackle the ch challenges that we were talking at the beginning. And from there on, from there in, 
take some of the best practices in order to put forward a plan that can actually be fulfilled by each one of, of the companies we're currently working in. Again, I'm not going to read this paragraph. This was the initial statement that we wrote all together. It took a long time to find an agreement and a consensus because, again, not all the companies were coming from, com from countries that had actually signed or were about to sign or were not about to withdraw well from the Paris Agreement. But we were very proud that we could actually find a formula that could fit everybody and could actually um, um, foster the acceleration of transitions towards a lower, a low carbon, sustainable and equitable energy future as mandated by the UN. So we have now basically uh, moved on to what is that we are doing in IPF nowadays and what we think it is important to do in the future in order to um, fulfill our tasks in terms of emission reduction and somehow behavior of uh, new energy transition culture. So what have we done internally and externally? Um, I'm sure that there will be quite a few of you from the different organizations that are here mentioned. Basically, we are acting in terms of uh, cooperations and work together at national, international, regional, and uh, somehow, so to say, supranational level. Uh, so to make sure that we are in contact with all the entities and institutions that are actually focusing their uh, work plan on energy transition. And that is the IAPG, which is the Argentinian um, Association of uh, Oil and Gas Companies, ARPEL, which is the regional one, AAPG is the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and of course, all the rest of uh, sort of international, supranational entities like the United Nations, of course, the European Union, the OECD, uh, SEADS, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, AT, and the Task Force on, on Climate Disclosure. All this, it's very relevant to us because we learn and because we take the best practices and try to apply them internally. And in terms of IPF itself, we think we've come a long way with big efforts in, try, in trying to shape our energy transition area, which is an area that moves across the company from the corporation to the more business oriented sectors to the technology center to our foundation. The IPF foundation has been crucial, especially for the rural areas and trying to apply methodologies of cooperation in terms of uh, renewable energy in uh, areas which are um, over the Argentinian territories. So this is internally and externally how we are, are articulating the subject and uh, uh, it was impossible not to mention what the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which is basically an association of the 13 major oil and gas or energy companies nowadays, which somehow sets for us the scene and, uh, and the way to follow in terms of what are the most urgent issues to deal with in terms of oil and gas or uh, generally energy integrated companies. And those are tackling methane emissions, so the ambition of the oil and gas initiative is that of reducing the percentage of methane emission associated to production from 0.3% to 0.2% by the year 2025. And what we are doing internally, as we will see in a minute, is basically follow, following that guideline. Of course, fostering energy efficiency, which by itself, it's one of the most important um, issues in terms of energy transitions and uh, uh, lowering emissions and uh, CO2 mitigations through carbon capture usage and storage. So we take those lineaments and we try to apply them internally to our plan so to stay in line with, with what uh, the, um, the major oil and gas companies are actually producing, proposing nowadays. 
And we do produce our own documents, as I said before, the one from the B20, uh, different campaigns that we have been able to put forward from IPF and internal reports. What you see here to the right is one of the most recent reports in terms of emissions that our upper management, actually the presidency, has asked us to put together so to understand what were the main risks and challenges in terms of emissions that the company was facing. So, um, just to show you what EPFA is doing today, in terms of safety and sustainability, we define those as our core values. We do reporting according to um, Dow Jones Index, which we follow, although we do not list them, but we do follow them. We are committed to the 10 principles of the United National Global Compact. We are members of 80. We are fostering our um, renewable energy consumptions, consumptions through the research center and the creation of IPFLUs. We launch different type of initiatives site, such as ventures to focus on an energy and, and, and clean mobility. And we are the first company to invest in micro mobility in the country. So we move forward and we're actually very proud of being able to report to you that. And as I said before, I do not want to um, sort of um, make you looking at graphs and where we stand it before and where we are now in terms of uh, uh, Robeco Sam index, but I would like you to concentrate on the fact that we are focusing very much on energy and resource efficiency and on mitigation strategies. I, we are taking those rules and applying them internally so to put forward a, a roadmap, which is the one that I'm about to show you. So. There is a lot of text here, but these are our uh, more or less 18 steps that we have decided as a company that we would like either to be leaders on or to be followers on, but to make them part of our current vision of how our business needs to tackle the energy transition issue. So I will have to read them out one by one, and I will try to do that in a sort of a fast and not too boring way. But it is important, uh, I think, as one of the main scopes of this webinar to let you know what our, what our grounds are sort of uh, based on. So we promote gas as a bridging fuel. We follow practices for carbon capture usage and storage, especially for gas storage, which is particularly relevant to our business. We have been building and sharing our uh, energy scenarios, so EPF proprietary scenarios uh, uh, that help us define our roadmaps between now, 2030 and 2040. As I said at the beginning of the work on the B20, we are committed to follow the path of just transition without stranded uh, human asset behind. In terms of energy efficiency, we have uh, created a commission, a specific commission on that, because as all the other companies, we think that energy efficiency is a strategic pillar in terms of uh, emission reduction. We do reward any energy waste through specific plans and certifications and standards. We are very keen in supporting the global discussion on carbon pricing for project screening. That means that we are starting to naturalize and internalize uh, carbon pricing when we do um, select projects. And in the way we select projects, the price for carbon is starting to be um, a, a relevant parameter. We incentivize the entry of new te technologies. We have a technology center associated to IPF, which is called ETEC, and that is providing new insights on energy infrastructure coming from innovation. Um, we are trying to set standards, especially for ground transportations and for heavy trucks duty, uh, because of course we have a lot of logistic and transportation uh, embedded in the in the company. Uh, in terms of um, access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy. We do provide decentralized solutions to rural community, and that is mainly done through the IPF Foundation. We have a plan of reforestation for carbon offtake. We are particularly strong in that, in the sense that we are recalculating uh, our carbon footprint and the carbon offtake necessarily to counterbalance that. Um, we are prior, prior, prioritizing policies 
in terms of resource efficiency and circular economy potential. Resource efficiency is particularly important for an oil company, and that is, um, I mean, for a company that has many oil assets. And that is particularly true in, the, in terms of recovery factors. There where we have an infrastructure in place, we need to be able to increase our recovery factor so to maximize what is already in place. And in terms of um, climate actions, um, there is quite a number of initiatives undergoing at the moment in IPF. Um, it is particularly important what we're doing in terms of measuring and mitigating our methane emission so that we can somehow cle clear our the black eye on gas production, which is the associated methane emission. And um, one specific point that we think is particularly relevant is that of contributing to the Bloomberg Initiative on disclosing finance number relating to climate. And I think that with that, we're almost done. We're just moving on to what is waiting ahead of us and what, what are the challenges and the opportunities ahead of us in terms of energy transitions. We think that we need to somehow have a clear um, low carbon accreditation program. BP has one with the carbon pioneers and a very articulated plan. And we are trying to do the same so that we can sort of uh, balance and manage and measure what are our carbon low carbon advancement throughout the different projects that we're bringing forward throughout the year certification it is very important to have the same companies that use to certify our reserves doing the same in terms of our emissions so that we can uh, basically um, have external external auditing on carbon management as I said before, foster the uh, risks, opportunities, and impact of our climate finances. Tracing carbon footprint all along our value chain, which is not an easy task, but that is the basis for then providing the appropriate car calculations for carbon uptake. And by that, I think that we are done. And we just have uh, one last slide that our um, vision on transforming lives through energy. And with that, I think I'm done. Thank you very much, Elena. That's uh, extremely comprehensive. Uh, thank you very much. Let me, uh, let me just, a couple things jumped out at me, just so you know that uh, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the data that you've, uh, you've cited, which uh, we, it was very important data, they're neighbors of ours here at, at UC uh, San Diego, just down the hill on the water. So, we don't exactly uh, share their Mauna Loa <coughs> facilities. That's a little bit of a different location, but nevertheless, the headquarters of Scripps is our neighbor here and colleagues across the way on campus. So thanks for uh, for sharing the UCSD, uh, the love as it were. And um, let me remind folks just uh, so you know about the question and we'll, we'll move to a question and answer session here. You can use the chat function um, there to pose a question. I just wrote the word question. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have about 10 minutes or so now or questions. Um, and the, other, the other thing I always, I always love. I, I only a geologist would uh, would use uh, data and graphics that uh, that speak and share trends across ten thousand and then <laughs> eight hundred thousand <No>. years. A <laughs> uh, little bit of a different timeline, I think geologists have, right? Than uh, than. I took the freedom to do that this time, Jeremy. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. No, I, I I just had to chuckle to myself uh, about sort of the the relevance to a geologist of something the trend lines across ten thousand, but especially eight hundred thousand years. Years. Um, let, let me jump right in. There was a question um, that, that I want to tee up here. So obviously, a lot of what you talked about had to do with reducing the intensity and in carbon emissions. Um, you talked about methane and for efforts on that, carbon capture. Um, so let, let's get into that a little bit more because I want to understand specifically, for example, on carbon capture, that's something a lot of folks talk about. It's, it's right in line with what you talked about in terms of the role of technology. So the question is, what exactly are you doing uh, in terms of carbon capture at YPF? Are there specific pilot projects? Are you doing uh, something that you can offer some more details about? And then there's a question here about how much CO2, CO2 do we need to capture? And I think that's, that's globally and probably referring to your, your discussion of the targets of the 2% or excuse me, the, the two degrees and that sort of global um, 
Paris Agreement target. So, so talk a little bit about that and, 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 and as much as you can, particularly the role of technology that leverage that you're leveraging at YPF. I think it could be interesting to hear more about that. Okay. Um, there, there, there is a lot to discuss about carbon capture usage and storage. It's a topic that was, um, I think, that has at least uh, 25 years of, of investigations, for sure, from the European Union, um, from the Horizon 2020 program. We have been sponsoring, mm -hmm. um, uh, we have been devoting a very large budget to the investigation in terms of carbon capture usage, usage and storage. And that practice nowadays is still only um, applied by a few of the major companies like Shell, Total, of course, um, Equinor nowadays. And it is a complex technology, especially the capturing part of CO2. In this respect, IPF will be a follower, will not be a leader. But what we are at the moment trying to lead and are working very hard on is the, the part of gas storage. So the reservoir characterization of gas storage, because we need that for storing our production of gas, is exactly the same type of science that we need in terms of reservoir characteriz characterization for injecting CO2. So to answer to your question, we are working on the reservoir portion of that. We are currently not yet working on the capturing of the CO2. And if I can be even more specific in terms of uh, my technical opinion on that, um, I think that uh, major oil companies and, uh, and uh, first world countries need to keep on employing and deploying carbon capture usage and storage. In terms of emerging economies, we may as, we may as well wait a little bit longer and see and basically concentrate and focus on those possible new technologies that will be able to absorb CO2 directly from the atmosphere. Why do I say that? I say that because, of course, emerging uh, economies have somehow lower budgets, and it is very important that we devote that budget to something that we know how to do and that is particularly useful in order to progress in what we are doing. So the idea is that we will be able to partner up, we will be able to team up and do consortium with other companies, but at the moment, IPF is not concentrating on technologies to, ca to capture CO2 and re-injecting. We are concentrating on the same aspect, but just in terms of reservoir characterization, for gas storage, which goes hand in hand with the CCUS. I hope that my answer was clear. No, no, absolutely. And I, I think you made a very interesting point that you're doing a certain elements of it, but what you're doing is also fo following sort of global technological developments. And as those move forward into a more commercial and scaled approach, uh, YPF will, will evaluate which is the best or what are the solutions for your um, your company, so. and, and and if if, if exactly th that is exactly the point. Thank you, Jeremy. And also stressing again that nobody needs to feel discouraged, <laughs> even if certain techniques are not handy for us. Because as I said, we as we said before, it's a matter of being ready for that. So as yeah. long as we have the human skills ready to take on board any best practice from the shelf of, of any other major companies and know how to do that, we can apply it tomorrow in case that our um, projects will have the finances able to support that type of technology. Perfect, perfect. So, so let me let me go back to this question of how much COT needs to be captured, but let's put it in the context of Argentina, Argentina's Paris Agreement commitments um, and then if you could add a sense, you know, well, wh where does YPF fit as the, the largest and major, you know, integrated energy company in Argentina? Where do you fit in terms of the Paris Agreement and the NDCs from Argentina? I know there's a lot there, but if you can un unpack some of that for us. Elena? Hello? We, we may have lost Elena's presence. Let's see. 
Elena, are you still there? Bear with us one second here. Well, let me take this moment. I think Elena's reconnecting. Uh, apologies. It seems like for something happened to her connection before we come back to Paris and, and Argentina's NDCs and commitment. Let me just uh, invite everyone uh, to be sure to, if you haven't already, to follow us on Twitter at IOA underscore energy. We're on Facebook as well. Um, also on LinkedIn. We tend to primarily use LinkedIn, the Institute of the Americas, and our Twitter, our IOA energy Twitter handle and account there. So follow us on those two social media channels. You can also, like I said, look us up on the other two, but principally for the energy information that we share and information about the webinar, including this recording and slides will go out for, via those social media channels. Um, let's see if we can get Elena back on the, on the line here. Sorry about that. Um, we'll try and get to your question here in a minute, uh, Raphael, if we could reconnect Elena. Um, Thank you, Ignacio. Excellent. Seems we're reconnecting. So I, I just to, if, if just in case uh, you all can hear me in Buenos Aires, well, when we come back talking about Paris and, and Argentina's NDCs, but I also wanted to wrap up with the question that Elena had mentioned something about. Uh, I want to make sure I heard it correctly. Micro mobility, and I wanted to wrap up with the question about what YPF is doing in terms of electric mobility, and if there's any part of the energy transition strategy that the company has in terms of deploying charging technology at its retail stations or at its gasoline stations? Are there any plans as part of the transition to, to further or to deploy um, EV charging infrastructure given the footprint and scope and scale of, of YPF's service and retail network? So if we can reconnect with Elena, hopefully she's, she's been able to, to hear that and Ignacio and uh, Joaquin, you guys as well, we'll give it a, couple of seconds here to reconnect her. Okay, it seems like we're having trouble reconnecting Elena, so um, I apologize for that. Um, uh, Ignacio, I don't think it's going to be possible to connect. Can you call in? I think we're, unfortunately, it seems like something's happened with the connection on the web platform here. Um, one second, please. Well, I regret that we're not going to be able to seems reconnect. Um, All right, we'll try a phone hookup here. Apologies, guys, on the fly here, trying to make technology work for us. 
give us one second to connect. Jackie, are you there? Can you please uh, connect Joaquin via the phone line? Okay, I, it looks like we're not going to be able to uh, to be able to connect. I'm not sure what's going on here. Apologize again, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, technology has let us down here at the very end. But we had a wonderful main presentation from Elena Moratini at YPF, so we greatly appreciate her time. Uh, sorry that we're not able to finish the Q and A session. We did have a couple of more things we wanted to discuss. So uh, sincere apologies about that, and um, we will try to. Uh, Let's see, give it one last chance here to see if we can reconnect, but it seems like it's not going to work out. So um, I greatly apologize, but it seems like this is a, uh, well, we will uh, we will try and continue this. Uh, perhaps we can have a follow on just simply Q&A session because I think there's a, a great amount of material here. And we, we certainly had a lot of uh, interesting points that were brought up during the course of Elena's presentation, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the interesting challenges and opportunity that YPS is embracing in Argentina. Well, thank you all very much for, uh, for joining us today. We greatly appreciate it. We will make available the slides from Elena's presentation. We'll share those and we'll share this recording as well. Have a wonderful day and please uh, stay tuned for our upcoming events. We will be, the Institute of the Americas will be collaborating with the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington, D.C. on December 11th for our annual program. We also will, of course, be planning future webinar series presentations in the coming weeks and months. Stay tuned via social media, but also we uh, share that via email. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful afternoon.